some people will always remember, I think clear in our memories, our teachers from the school days, and especially, yes, headmistresses and headmasters. And so it is that many old boys of Magdalen College School all over the world remember with affection their former headmaster, Robert Stanier. And I'm delighted to say that he, he's our guest of Roundabout this morning in our weekly profile series. Robert, which, which were those years that you were at the school? Well, I was um, usher or second master from 1935 to 1944, and then I became a headmaster and stayed on doing that job until 1967. Bob ended his career as a highly successful headmaster, and we'll have a lot more to say about that later on. But first, we'll go back over 100 years to his earliest days. This final chapter starts in Ealing with my great-grandfather, Thomas Hollis Hopkins. If any of my own grandchildren are watching, this is your great-great-great-grandfather. Thomas had left England for Australia without a penny to his name in 1860, but he returned 30 years later, a very rich man with a very big house. He also had a friend, Tom Bolland, who lived nearby and was a very good photographer, as you can see from these photos of the family. There was one lovely photo that Bolland took of Thomas and his wife, Annie, a really great portrait of an old married couple. Thomas Hopkins had eight children. His eldest daughter called Kathleen was very beautiful and she attracted the attention of a young man called Charles Stanier. This was important because Charles is my grandfather. Charles would in due course become the chief engineer of the London Underground, but at this stage, he was just making his way in the world. Exciting times. And in 1905, the two of them got married. The wedding reception was at the family house, quite a tribal gathering. Up at the top of the wedding photo is his brother, William, who would become even more successful than Charles, but we'll come back to him later. Everything seemed to be going well, but in 1914, World War I erupted. For the grown-ups, it was a terrible time, and Thomas Hopkins was distraught when his eldest son, Staunton, was killed in action. At one stage, it looked as though the Germans would win, and the government appealed to the nation to contribute money to the war effort. Thomas Hollis, still mourning his son, went to his bank, took out a thousand pounds in new banknotes, stuffed them into his bag, and walked off round to the government office to hand it over. Now, that's quite impressive, but even more impressive is the fact that in those days, a thousand pounds was the equivalent of two million pounds. Imagine stuffing that into a bag and walking around the streets of London with two million pounds in your bag. Astonishing. So yes, it was a tough time for the adults, but for young Bob and his brother Tom, the war was very exciting. They followed the fortunes of the British and German navies, and each time a ship was sunk, they would cross it off from their books about the British and German navies. They would also reenact the battleship encounters in their bedroom. Tom would be one ship on top of the bunk bed, and Bob would be another battleship in the bottom bed, fighting it out. Younger sister Anne had no real part in this. She was told just to lie under the bed and be a submarine. After the war, Bob and Tom went off to be boarders at Berkhamsted School. Bob eventually became head boy, and here he is sitting next to the headmaster, Charles Green. Graham Green, the famous novelist, was Charles Green's son and was at school at the same time as Bob. And Bob could see that this was a difficult thing for both Graham Green and his father, and perhaps explains why later on, Bob did not want me and Robin to be educated at MCS while he himself was the headmaster. Meanwhile, we go back to William Stanier, Bob's uncle, the man in the wedding photo. 
At about this time, he was appointed Chief Mechanical Engineer at the LMS, the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. Back to Bob. He was always bent on being a teacher. His first job after university was at King's School, Canterbury, and at this time he got engaged to Maida. Thereby hangs quite a story. Bob had met Maida for the first time down in Devon and spent two weeks together, and then he offered to drive her back to London. Now, the funny thing is that the odd thing, he'd never driven a car in his life and he borrowed a friend's battered old car. You didn't need a driving license in those days. You didn't have to pass your tests. You just took off, off you went. And they took off making slow erratic progress, particularly because the car had a leaking radiator, which meant that every 30 miles they had to stop to top it up with water. And it took a hell of a long time to get to London. And there was serious danger that Maida would miss her last train to Suffolk. But they finally got to Liverpool Street, ran down the platform, and had Bob deposited Maida in the, in, the, in the train. She'd look out of the window to say goodbye, and he proposed to her. But before she could say yes or no, the train pulled out of the station. <laughs> However, at the next station, she got out, sent a telegram Bob to Bob, and the answer was yes. Let's come on to an entirely different aspect of your life, and it goes back, I know, to very early days, and that is your painting, your watercolours. Now, when did all this start? When I was at a very early age, my parents decided that I ought to have some drawing lessons. There is a certain amount of uh, artistic talent in my family tree. I've had several professional painters in my, among my ancestors, and uh, so they, when I was at the City of London School, they put me down for drawing lessons, which lasted for a term, in the first half of which I did nothing but draw a butterfly in a glass case, and uh, the second half I did nothing but draw a scorpion in another glass case, and it didn't seem to be getting me much further, so drawing lessons then stopped. Uh, but I was always interested in uh, drawing, and uh, when I was about uh, 25 or 30, uh, my sister had a bad illness, and we wanted to think of some occupation that would be not too strenuous in the period of convalescence. So we took up um, watercolour painting, and we've both done it ever since. When I was uh, functioning as a teacher, it was mainly a holiday occupation, I always took my paints on holidays and uh, occasionally on picnics and this kind of thing. And uh, on that trip round the world, uh, it was uh, very pleasant to have a record. I mean, when other people were jumping out of buses and photographing views and buildings and so on, uh, I was jumping out and whipping out my little sketchbook and a fountain pen and making sketches which I touched up uh, later and it made a, a very agreeable record. Bob stopped being headmaster in about 1967 and the years yeah. went by, headmasters came and went. And uh, round about 2000, I think, it's the first time I wanted to go back and wander around the playing fields, possibly, Robin, because you were over. And I rang up the school rather nervously. This was 30 years after Bob had been headmaster and said, uh, look, um, my, my name's Tom Stanier. Um, I, I used to live here, so my father was the master. And we wondered if we could walk around the playing fields. And the voice at the other end said, not the Stanier, not the legendary Stanier. So this was just the person answering the phone said that automatically. Yeah. And I thought that was it's rather strange. But then about 10, ten years later, there's a headmaster then called Tim Hands, who was a very nice guy. Uh, Robin, you met him with me, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And he wanted to, he knew there were a lot of old boys around that had a terrific affection 
uh, for Bob. And uh, he obviously was partly doing this as a sort of fundraising thing, he had an idea, but he also wanted this, the values that Bob stood for to be part of the school as it is 50 years later, even the 21st century. And he's going to start something called the Bob Stanier Society, and would we be patrons and whatever? And uh, I would say, yes, yes, fine. I was rather, rather baffled. Clearly, this is partly a fundraising thing, and they're going to have uh, an annual lunch to which uh, Alex has been as well. Uh, came twice, I think, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. And the new master, who's a woman, actually, a rather formed of a woman, she also uh, seems very enthusiastic about this. And it'll die out shortly. When the old boys have died out, who've who remembered him, it'll, it'll fade away. But it, it was a remarkable tribute that this is now uh, over 50 years since he was master there. And the fact that his name is still remembered and means something is extraordinary. I mean, I think what was amazing, actually, was that he managed the school you know, with the help of one secretary. Yes. To start off with. Yeah. It's almost unbelievable now. Go yeah. back to school now, and this whole army of uh, admin people uh, behind him, <coughs> behind the headmaster. Uh, I mean, the idea of having a Bob Stein, an archivalist at the school, uh, was just astonishing. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, it's just amazing you know, the, what the, the way his reputation has stood the test of time. I, I'm going to throw one more question in, which is mine, but it's just come to me, which is the relationship between MCS and Magdalen College. Because I have a, some idea that Grandpa would sometimes go and dine with the Dons. Yeah. But I don't know why yeah. or how or what the deal was. Bob was never a fellow or a Don, but he was an integral part of the college. Bit, probably the same sort of ranking as someone like the Burster might yeah. have been, you yeah. know, familiar with all the people. Yeah. And uh, but there was a, trained one amongst them. But there was actually, when he took over the school in 1944, it was in a bad way. And a lot of people, members of the college, the Dons, actually wanted to get shot of the school. They thought it was a liability. Why should they pay for a choir? and you know choristers and the chapel and all that let's get rid of the school and one of the things uh bob felt he had to do was to go and dine at the high table with these very high powered dons and he had to show them that he was a, a man worth taking taking seriously and yeah. he could do that he, he was very bright and he could talk to any of the dons on their subjects uh, whereas most dons can only talk about their own subject, or a lot of them stuck to their own subjects. And he would go there and hold his own conversationally. And he felt also he had to hold his own drinking because they drank a hell of a lot. And one night he was coming back after dinner and he'd he taken his bicycle for some reason. And he was wobbling off on his bicycle to come back over Morton Bridge uh, in his black tie and whatever. And a policeman stopped him and very kindly said, um, I think we'd be better off walking, sir, don't you? Oh, and no. So he walked over uh, the road and went to bed and, <coughs> and very great honour reflected on all parties. Um, and what distance was that that he was trying to cycle? I mean, he can't oh, walk them about. Yards. Yeah. I, I think he must, I don't know why he had a bicycle there, but he definitely was cycling back in a very erratic way. Right. <laughs> The distance from the, the school to the front door of the college was such that the front door of the college closed at midnight. And if I was at home in MCS and I had to get back to the college I had, where I had a room, I had to get that by midnight. And I knew that if I left home uh, when the clock started striking 12, I could get across the bridge to the front door by the time the clock finished striking yeah. twelve. Yeah. So that was uh, probably probably I about a two minute uh, jack. I was going to say that's a testament to the fact you were a sprinter. Not many other people could probably <laughs> yeah. have done that. Yeah, there were photos of uh, the staff. You know, Bob sitting in the middle of them, 
and I came across them recently, and I was surprised how small the, the numbers of staff were. Yeah. But they were, they were a funny mix. Some, some of them were absolutely brilliant people, and one or two were old gaffers who'd been there forever, and they couldn't get rid of them. But most well, of them I think were, one of Bob's skills was his ability to pick staff. Yeah, um, I think when he arrived at the school, there was a lot of dead wood. Yeah. Uh, but he gradually got rid of them, or they left. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of members of staff, you know, went on to become headmasters of their own schools. Yeah. In different places. Yeah. But uh, there were a lot of very good staff. Yeah. In hindsight, very good staff. And he was very well liked by the staff. You know, he, yeah. he, he chose people who, who he'd get on with, I think. Uh, yeah, and who would fit into the sort of ethos of the school as he saw it, uh, yeah. and it worked very well. It's very successful. What do you think is your greatest memory of Bob Sanger? Commemoration. Those days, Commem was in July. And it started off with the commemoration service in the University Church and the, the Lily Hymn. And then there was a mad rush to the town hall from prize giving. And Bob's speeches at prize giving were hilarious. Joke after joke after joke. And the whole school was laughing throughout his speech. Not at him, but with him. Mm. I just have a vivid image of him always sort of being involved. He, if you come and always watch the rugby team, and he'd probably be wearing his greyhound sock because he played for the Oxford University greyhounds. If it was cricket, he'd be watching, if not playing. He was the slowest leg break bowler <laughs> in the history of cricket, I can assure you. Of that. They went a long way up and a long way down, but he was very white. <laughs> he painted, as you see, you know, you'd see him with his watercolours sometimes, or carrying his double bass to go and play in an orchestra. Uh, he was extraordinary. I, and of course he wrote, he wrote the history of the school. He edited, a, I think, a collection of Greek poetry. Uh, he was a he was really a true sort of all round liberal gentleman really um, and a fantastic model for that. I remember when Stalin died and Khrushchev took over, it was apparent that the Russia was going to open itself up to the West to some extent. And my father thought it was important that there should be some Russian lessons offered. There was no one in the school who could teach Russian. So he said, okay, I'll teach myself Russian. <laughs> and I remember him, he taught himself Russian by reading the whole of War and Peace in Russian. And I can remember him for about nine months with this bloody great Russian dictionary plowing through it. And then, then I think they got some Russian specialists afterwards. But he would turn himself to whatever was necessary. Father yeah. rather unusually became more left-wing as the older he got. Yeah. Uh, and the, he was the only headmaster in the, head, in the headmaster's conference, that's the public school's body, that had a CNT badge, <laughs> which deeply shocked <laughs> many of the other, uh, other headmasters. And I remember being, uh, I was actually in the drawing room and he'd been, they'd been giving lunch to some general or other who would be come down to do one of those CCF inspections. Oh, yeah. And my father had his CND. <laughs> <laughs> and the general, general said, Toby Master, do, do you have any trouble with these CND fellows? <laughs> <laughs> and my father said, well, I, I can't get enough of them interested in it. That's my main problem. <laughs> one of the, I, I think, greatest educationists that I've met, and I consider myself privileged to have been appointed to school and benefited from his experience for three years. Uh, and it, it certainly influenced my philosophy of looking for the all-round pupil you know, to encourage them to take part in as many things as possible. A proper 
indeed inspirational, all-round human being.